Uh, thanks, Simon, for allowing me the opportunity to speak. My name is Robbie P. Um, I work for a company called Unum Capital, and I am the joint head of trading um, at the company. Uh, I'm on the front line. I buy and sell stuff all day long. Um, I did see the the ad that went out about the discussion topic this evening. Um, I have changed the script a little bit because I, I felt that if I was going to start investing today in this day and age, I don't think it's necessary to get too clever because the minute investing becomes complicated, um, you, you start losing the plot. And I think a few simple ideas will take you a really long way, uh, especially today. As a, as a new investor, or if you need to panel beat your, your existing portfolio as it is. I also need clients. However, however, our company is a private client business, and we've, are, <laughs> we've discovered that an informed client, an educated client, those are the ones that tend to be successful, especially in our business. Okay, so... If I'm going to leave you with anything tonight, uh, I'm not running a stall at a flea market. Definitely not. Um, I'm just going to offer you the basic tools that you would probably need with some of my own logic attached to it. And creating returns in a low growth world couldn't be more apt at this point in time. So. The things we're going to go through, shoe fly, is find, finding growth in a low growth world. Um, we're going to discuss low growth, what stands in our way, supplementing a portfolio, your idea about what you want in terms of returns. We're going to have to adjust our expectations a little bit, especially looking into the next year or two. And... Um, you'll see that just by applying simple logic, we'll automatically protect ourselves against downside. So I'm going to keep this really, really simple, and it's something I apply when I look at my own money. So I'm happy to share that with you. So first of all, alpha is just a term. Um, all it simply means is the returns of an investment relative to a benchmark or an index. So don't worry about the word. This is about finding growth where there isn't any. Right. So just to give you the broad um, idea of how assets behave in a low growth environment, investors tend to go for safety, even more so now in America, because they're starting to slow down and slow down quite rapidly. I don't know if any of you watch Bloomberg TV. A lot of those smart guys are saying, well, geez, stuff is slowing down. This market is potentially going into recession. But they've been saying that since 2009, and I think they said it four times. And the S&P 500 is at all-time highs. Anyway, weak economies like ours, and theirs need low interest rates. That's how you keep this engine burning. Okay? You might not be running on 95 octane. You might have been mixing it up a little bit with some cooking oil, but it's going. Okay? And most of the third world or developed countries are keeping their interest rates as low as possible to keep this, this going. And this is called artificial demand. Okay? And once that stops, there's only one place for yields to go your return, growth. Luckily, we're not at the top in our market. They are, however, in the US. We've got, across the globe, lower GDP growth forecasts. Now, that creates volatility in GDP because investors react accordingly. So the one thing you can be certain of is that markets might still go up but they're not going to go up like they have over the last six years. Okay? So don't expect these double-digit 18% top 40 returns. It's not a bad thing, though. So just locally, 
and I want to put this in a local context. Um, our problems at the moment is weak sentiment amongst investors. It's very difficult to get guys to buy into this African, South African story um, because our growth projections have been lowered again. So now we're all the way back to the projections they had in 2018. Please come in. The other problem we have is that that big decline we saw in manufacturing, especially in this country, it was the biggest we've had in 10 years. So that's 10 years ago was the crash, 2009. That's when we hit rock bottom. We've also got a very high unemployment rate, which means falling tax revenues. Guys have got less money to spend. Um, ESCOM has an effect on manufacturing. When there's power outages, um, it costs BHP Billiton millions and millions and millions of dollars a day when they are without power. Um, and also we've got a Moody's ratings problem. Thanks to policy uncertainty, there's no firm path going forward yet, and they've given us till March. And also our debt is spiraling out of control as a country. Okay. Um, if we move on. Now, as an investor, I mean, it doesn't matter what you do for a living. When circumstances change, you have to change. Otherwise, you'll be left behind. And this really isn't rocket science, guys. There just happens to be a new playbook now for investors. I'm not saying that we're all, gonna, we're all in trouble and we're going to lose money. Because over time, st statistics say that the longer time goes on, the more your risk decreases. You will make money. What I said was don't expect double digit returns with your buy and hold strategy. But the, why I say the playbook has changed is that the influence of what happens on TV, policymakers, the minute they open their mouth, asset prices react. It never used to be like that to this extent. Risk on, risk off sentiment changes like that. I sit on a Thursday and watch jobless claims and I can I can see that dollar candle spike this big, retrace and then find direction. So volatility has increased even though the VIX doesn't say so, but your ultra short term price movements are more drastic and this is one thing you need to forget about as a medium to longer term investor. Um, but you've got to take advantage somehow. I mean, you'd be a fool not to. Even though you're a long-term investor, you need to leave some room, some ammo to take advantage of short-term moves while the other stuff does their thing. Okay? And it's also not very difficult to do. That's why I say an increase in volatility provides opportunity. It is a different opportunity. I'm not saying rush out and buy Bitcoin, I'm just saying there are <laughs> opportunities. Okay, so desired returns. As I said, the, the playbook has changed. We, we need to start getting a little bit more realistic. Um, but you also have to know yourself and understand how much risk you're prepared to take on. But your first target, this is out the starting blocks, is just to beat inflation. Because if you can't afford a Coke at 15 Rand 50 next year because it's 14 Rand 80 this year, you're in trouble. Okay, now we just get to the nuts and bolts. And as I said, this is extremely basic. This is how portfolios are constructed. Now there are thousands of strategies. But I like mine better because I can understand it. And by the end of this, so will you. This is how... Portfolio managers structure a portfolio with these four pillars. Bonds, cash, property, and stock. So if we break these down, and the one thing you'll realize as I keep talking, I don't like complicated stuff. I like keeping it really, really simple. Okay, so let's just break them down. Now, this is one part of our industry that I find extremely complicated, so I can only imagine how, how individual investors must feel for the most part. But anyway, what a bond does is, is it pays you interest. They call that a coupon um, over the period. So if you hold it for the whole time or the whole um, time frame of that bond, 
uh, you'll get all your money back plus the interest that you earned over time. So you become the lender. Okay. Um, why it's in the portfolio is because they do the opposite of what equities does usually. So when the market crashes, bonds go up and vice versa. When the markets start rallying, bonds go down. Good evening. They also tend to be a lot less risky than, than equities, but the flip side of that is that they probably return less risk and reward. However, you do need that kind of protection. Yes, sir. Sorry, you're saying bonds go up. You're talking about the interest. Yes. Sorry, the the yield. Yeah. Okay. Um, you do have two streams of income here. You, you get capital growth with the bond, and you also get your interest returns. Okay? But they are affected by interest rates. Some of our stocks are also in, um, affected by interest rates. But as I said, very difficult to sit with an investor and go, we need to do this, look at this bond, this bond, this yield. Um, so... By virtue of that, I take the easy way out, which we'll get to. Then cash is the worst. I hate cash because I spend it so fast. Basically, that part of your investment earns interest. Simple as that. It's the lowest risk, provides the lowest return. It's the worst performing of the four asset pillars. Okay. Property. Now you can buy and own property, like residential, commercial, and industrial property, or you can invest in listed property or ETF, exchange traded funds. Okay. Uh, listed property is like a hybrid between bonds and equities. Okay. They have a low correlation to equities, but they tend to correlate with bonds because they also get affected. By interest rates. So when interest rates go lower and lower and lower, people start liking property because you can borrow more to buy more. Okay? But they do, what I like about property is that they're forced to pay you out regularly because most of their income comes from rental. So it's not dividends, but they have to give you that dis uh, distribution on a regular basis. And that's why they're in, because they keep up quite nicely with inflation. And then equities. Easy peasy. You make money when they go up. You don't when they go down. Um, you also get dividends. They do historically offer the best returns. And if you're in the right stuff, your dividends go up over time and you're happy by the time you're 60. But they are volatile. And as everybody knows who's ever owned Steinhoff, nothing's guaranteed. Right, so I've now gone, I would, I personally, because I'm not 150 years old yet, I would go a lot higher into equities, but for the purpose of this chat, I've gone conservative, just to show you where you can find growth. So I would split 40% of my money into the cash-like and property stuff, and 60% into shares. And the reason I've gone this way is to show you that you can still make money. I, I read something on Twitter the other day. It says bulls make money, bears make money, even chickens make money, but pigs get slaughtered. So if you get greedy, I think you probably feel it in your pocket at the end of the day. So anyway, a couple of things that I've found is that um, ETFs are really popular among new investors. So I have decided to lean more towards ETFs, but also because I'm a lazy investor, and I know so are you, um, I like exchange-traded funds because I can understand them. I know it's a basket of stuff that they paid somebody a lot of money for to create to make it easy for me to buy and sell, and there's a fund fact sheet, and it tells me this thing goes like this over time, and it's done that for the last five years. So some of the ones that I've found, if you're going to go into, well, you are going to go into bonds, cash and listed property, I would probably leave cash completely out. I have an FNB account and they keep throwing credit card money at me, so I'll just use it. Personal inflation is a bad thing. So, <laughs> new funds, Gavi, there you get paid your coupon every three months, I think, Simon. Okay. Um, then we also have a government bond, which is inflation linked. 
and the Ashburton inflation linked ETF. That's all you want. Now, if we look onto the property side of things, this is where stuff gets really interesting. Now, just remember that in my business, our clients have exposure to the world. We provide both local and offshore equities and derivatives. But in a South African context, for a South African investor on the South African Stock Exchange, I have found everything available to us. Okay? So this is where I start looking for offshore exposure because I'm not really confident about South Africa for the next 18 months. So this is where my portfolio is going. Listed property. We have a core shares prop tracks. That's an index of the best property stocks that we've got. I like it. Satrix also has an ETF that you can buy. But if we look at offshore, core shares has a global property fund. Now, interest rates are a lot lower everywhere else. So I kind of like that. And so does Signia have a global property fund. And those are really easy to buy. You buy them just like you buy shares. Okay. Then the 60%, this is where I seek my alpha. When I got divorced, I left mine in the garage for my ex-wife because I don't like to take my problems with me. But this is a different alpha. Yeah, we're going to look at stock selection, liquidity, and protection against the downside. Okay, And this will happen automatically, as I said. You can change now. Right. We're in the pursuit of alphaness. Right, so when you're looking for alpha, now I'm applying this theory to both stocks and ETFs because I like to keep things simple. But if you're buying a share, you're normally looking for companies whose sales are least affected in a downturn. You want steady dividends. They must have some kind of business outside of this country, preferably in Europe or America. You've also got to look at future technology and what will the investments of the future be? Because, I mean, I think I've heard Paul Teron say for the last 10 years, don't buy SAPI. No one's going to use paper anymore. And he was probably right because the share price has more than halved and their debt is a mountain. But it's easy to avoid those kinds of stocks, but your your mission has to be to find what's the current future investment. Again, Bitcoin is probably one of them, but I'm not prepared to pay $10,000 for one. And then you have to try and avoid the most cyclical stocks. Now, we'll get to that because that's a conundrum. So I'm going to introduce you to a core and satellite strategy. Very simple. And the picture says it all. So the core of the portfolio consists of ETFs or collective investments. So they will track either a market or an index. Okay? So you will not be excluded from the performance of that market or that index. You will have exposure to it and or the, the upside or the downside. So theoretically, the meat of our portfolio is going to be the core, and it will perform as that market does. So what do we want to track? Again, sales, least affected in a downturn. Okay, we're going to go to ETFs now, so we're not worried about sales. We look at sales when we, when we start selecting stocks. Good evening, guys. And dividends, I think, we'll leave up to the individual stocks as well. But you want offshore exposure, investments of the future, and try and avoid highly cyclical stocks. But let's just explain, um, and this is not being condescending. I think very few people understand when they watch Bloomberg and they say, oh, no, on, you got to get out of cyclicals. And, um, because actually everything is cyclical. So Standard & Poor's classifies cyclical stocks into 10 sectors, well, stocks into 10 sectors. Consumer staples and utilities in the U.S. are the only non-cyclical stocks. The rest are cyclical, so it's almost impossible 
not to be involved in some kind of cyclical stock. Now, sorry. There we go. I just wanted to go back to this slide. A cyclical stock is something or a company that sells something consumers can afford to buy more of when times are good, when the economy is growing. That's most stuff. But I'm talking about big ticket items, houses, cars, loans. Okay, so I'm going somewhere with loans. Let me just remind you, weak investor sentiment, slowing growth, factory activity slowing down, high interest rates, high cost of living, and individual South Africans are some of the most indebted in the world. That's a problem. So in my opinion, banks, highly cyclical. They make money from borrowing and lending. Okay. What's happening here is there's a reduced ability for the banks to fund those borrowings. Bank lending is getting more stringent. Less people are qualifying for loans. That's slowing down. It's not speeding up. We're not at the top of a cycle here. And delinquencies are rising. Standard Bank cucked out my wife the other night because she forgot her credit card payment. So it's a thing. So let's go back to our core now. We're just on the ETFs now. We haven't looked at stocks or anything. Okay. So I want offshore exposure. I want to avoid financials in our context, and I'm including in our financial index insurers and that type of stuff, because when times are tough, the first thing you cancel is your life policy, and then after that, if you're really in trouble, your medical aid, etc. And this is kind of where we are at the moment. But then we have to, investments of the future, you've got to look for themes, and Okay, we'll get to themes in a second, but in terms of offshore exposure, there's some more ETFs where you can get that offshore exposure in RANDs in your local Johannesburg Stock Exchange account. You can get exposure to Euro Stocks 50, FTSE 100, Japan, US, emerging markets, etc. But this is kind of the stuff that I sort of looked at, and I've, I've added the S&P 500 um, just to show that it's there. Core shares also have one. Um, I hold it, but not for very much longer. Let's do the time warp again. So, my theme. This is a real thing. It's the fourth industrial revolution. So, I went onto the World Economic Forum website and they said the fourth industrial revolution represents a fundamental change in the way we live, work, and relate to each other. It's a new chapter in human, our development, enabled by extraordinary technology advances. What does that little quote tell you? It tells you that this new generation is coming. The technology is here, and it's getting better and better and faster and faster and further away from us. That's why, let me just take you through here, we've gone from... The first industrial revolution, they invented the steam engine. Then it was mass production. We've then, uh, industrial revolution 3.0, we've discovered the internet and nuclear energy. And there's been this, this gap, but all of a sudden, with everything out there, everything's gone haywire. Technology has gone crazy. From cell phones, cloud computing, Artificial intelligence, big data analysis, there are algorithms that can, can calculate just about anything, even a company's um, financial results. Um, they're making stuff, 3D stuff out of printers. So the future is already here, and if you're not in it, you're going to be left really far behind because it's, it's moving so rapidly. So that's the theme I've decided to go with because... I'm not an idiot. So what my core looks like so far, I've stripped out financials, and luckily for us, you don't have to buy the whole top 40. You can leave them out. 
and you can buy the Satrix Industrials and the Satrix Resources. You've had a fantastic run so far this year. I'm loving it. We look at offshore. I've looked at Signia Eurostox 50. I know Europe is in trouble, but they're not at all-time highs. They've lagged the U.S. by some way. So there has to be some point in time where that gap closes. So that's my banker for later. And then I still believe in emerging markets because they have underperformed. And I do think we're going to see a massive, massive run when Donald Trump and China shake hands at the end of the day. Or he gets impeached or doesn't get voted in. And the next president shakes his hand or her hand with China. So I do think there's a real opportunity in emerging markets, and I don't have the time to go and analyze which economies and markets are the best ones to invest in. So I'm just going to go for the whole basket of emerging markets. So you can see I'm throwing my net really wide here. I'm covering the globe in the core. Then my thematic ETF is the Fourth Industrial Revolution Exchange Traded Fund, also by Signia, called the SIG4IR. And I found a nice little Satrix, NASDAQ 100. Tech stocks, I want to be involved. I don't have a US dollar account to go and buy Apple. But I can buy the Satrix NASDAQ, and it will track that. And it also gives you a bit of protection because you're buying it in RAND. So when the RAND gets a little bit weaker, so does that ETF go higher. So, so far, my core looks like this, out of my 60%. Now, how much am I spending? Again, I don't expect everyone in the room to have a million bucks, but this is just for easy maths. Um, we've gone 40, 60 on a million. That means 400,000 of my million is going into bonds, scrap cash, and listed property, and the bulk of it into equities, slash ETFs. Right, so this is just a diagram to, to show what this means, because now what we're doing here is now I want to spread my risk around, throw the net as wide as I can, and not risk too much of my capital all in one basket. This is all I'm doing here. So did you say the middle one is the red light? Okay, it's not working on the screen, but that's fine. So I'm using 30% of the 600,000, not of the million. Now we're on the equity basket. Local ETFs, Satrix Industrials, I'm going 10%, purely because there's too much NASPAS in that. Um, resources, I'm going a little bit higher because, again, um, they've had a fantastic run. Uh, they sell their stuff in dollars, whatever they pull out of the ground. If ESCOM gets their nonsense sorted out and bailed out enough times, I think their production will probably increase and get better. But also, the, the US-China spat does have an effect on our resource counters, and so does our exchange rate. Offshore, like I said, I'm going for Euro stocks, Satrix Emerging, Mar uh, emerging Markets 15-15. They've both lagged the US market. I don't think the US market is the space I want to play in anymore. Um, or not for very much longer. And then our thematic, 25% into the fourth industrial revolution because this is my banker holder and then hopefully I can pay for my child's university when this all comes together. And then 20% in the Satrix NASDAQ exchange traded fund. So you can see that out of my million, I've only spent 180,000 Rand on the core. Okay, now I'm not here to pick stocks for you this evening because we'll be here all night and we're not going to do analysis on all these companies, but this is where you get to play, okay? Just a little pointer for you. In the middle there, I'm going to spend now 360000 of the 600000 okay? But let me just go back to this thing. The Signia Fourth Industrial Revolution, where I've gone 25% of that has a 4.5% effect of the million, of the whole portfolio. Okay, So I don't think it's overly exuberant, but that's where I'm placing my bet. 
But even if you pick stocks now, and you're only spending 22,000 Rand per stock, that's so that you avoid minimum trade fees, depending on who your broker is. With that, you can buy 15 to 16 stocks, and that's enough. That's plenty. You can over-diversify yourself into no returns. Okay? So, in my mind, 15 stocks is tops because you've got a core of good stuff that buys you the protection that you need and you've thrown your net wider. But anyway, at 22 grand a stock, each stock only represents 2.2% risk on that whole portfolio. So, even if you get a Tongart or a Steiner, it's 2.2% gone. That's fine. You can make that back. Okay? But you have to diversify across sectors when you're stock picking. Um, I would avoid trading small caps because there you're really looking for one gem that's in, in like one of those gem sand boxes, one that's going to really shine and give you a 10 bagger. I don't play in that space. I like to trade liquid stocks that I can get in and out of because you have to be nimble, especially in today's age. Prices move a lot quicker than they used to. We don't read the prices in the newspaper the next day. Um, and then dividends. Dividends are important. But the one warning I'm going to give you is don't go through the list and say which companies pay the highest dividends. That's a problem. In my experience, I have found that the companies with the highest dividends, and Vodacom is a really good example, 5.5% dividend yield. Pile in, because you're getting 5%. But that's a clear sign that there's something wrong here. And the likely scenario is that those dividends will start coming down over time. What you do do when you look for dividends is you go and find a company that started paying dividends or pays a steady dividend that rises steadily over time, year over year over year. Even if it's by a few percent, but it's still going up. Okay, don't hunt big dividends to start with. Chase the ones that are climbing. That'll put you on the right track. Then I've gone off the normal scenario here. I know that we said I left out cash, so I've brought it back into the equity part of it. But this is opportunistic. So 10% of the 600, so 60 grand. That's for you to have fun with or protect yourself with. So supplementing your risk capital. <laughs> Be prepared to lose it. Okay. This is high-risk capital, ready to deploy for high-conviction speculation. If you want to trade Forex with it, do it. If you think the RAND's going to collapse by February, do it. Okay? But have the capital ready to deploy. You can buy yourself protection with this money and get in and out. But what you can also do is you can hedge certain parts of your portfolio. So if Apple, for example, comes out with bad results, you can then go and short that Satrix NASDAQ for a day or two until it covers. So, and then you've, what you lose on this side, you're making on the other side by short selling. But that's up to you. That's for speculation. That's where you get your alpha. Take a gamble, take a chance, have some fun in the market on these short term opportunistic moves. So, it's not cash, cash. That's going to cost you money. But that's okay because you've diversified yourself into growth already with the other stuff. Okay. Unless you're one of those who prefers to just sit and wait for growth. But unfortunately, the playbook has changed. So here we are. The coin satellite strategy. Now, all of a sudden, with the bonds, cash, ETFs, and the equity ETFs and stocks, we've got 58% of the portfolio that's made up of ETFs. That's quite high if we have a global crash. Okay? Your risk bucket is the stocks on the outside. So the rest of that 100% is on stocks on the outside, and that's where you have to be nimble. You've got to be able to identify market trends. Um, if you have a good broker, you're going to get all the notes in the morning, etc. But this way, you don't miss out on a further run on, on indices or markets, and you get to speculate within your own universe in South Africa. 
and then I've left out the gambling money part of it on the outside because I've basically written it off. But you could double it in a week or a month. You can also wipe it out in a day. But it's not going to have a detrimental effect on your portfolio. And this is kind of how I would structure a conservative portfolio, but trying to generate that growth, that alpha. But the theme is important. So our game plan, all we've achieved here is with the bonds and property, we've kept up with inflation and earning yield. Nine out of ten times you'll keep up with inflation. Where we seek the alpha, just by the equities and those ETFs that we've selected, we've got offshore exposure to boost our returns, alpha. We're tracking major markets, alpha. We get to handpick stocks with growth and dividend potential. A lot of our stocks have taken some pretty hefty hits lately. Um, so there are opportunities in the market. I've left out banks completely. Okay, We have thematic exposure, which will make you money over time. And we also now, with that gambling money, we have the ability to speculate or hedge. Okay, So what we've done here is we've dampened the downside risk on SA, SA Inc. Because of our exposure to overseas markets. So I know 58% is high in an ETF holding, but not a lot of that is here. And you can switch that anytime you want because your size of your trade is cheap enough to switch out of and buy something else. So all we've done is thrown our net really, really wide with a little bit of aggression to try and squeeze out growth. Our all share index is only up 8% for the year. Only. I don't think it's going to close up 8% for the year. So that's what we're trying to achieve. Beat inflation and beat the returns a South African investor would get from our market. That's it. That's all I want to do. If you've done that, all you want to do is win by three. You want to be ahead. That's it. And it's not difficult. This is a very simple strategy that while I said there are thousands of them, I think if you start off with that kind of logic, and looking at a theme of your own, it might even be cannabis. I don't care, but have a theme. Because even flipping a coin is a strategy. It doesn't work all the time, though. But if you just have a little bit of a plan like that, before you start investing, at least you know what your game plan is. And you can adapt to your own risk appetite. You Only, only you care about your money as, as much as you do. Okay, Nobody un understands what it took to get it what it took to make it. So it'll take a lot if you lost it. So take control. Have a plan. That simple logic will get you off to a really good start, I think. And you can be as aggressive as you want. I personally would have gone 70% equity, even though the S&P 500 is at all-time highs and there's all this Brexit, US-China stuff going on. I'd be more aggressive. I've got time on my side. And I'm a little bit of a psychopath. So that's it, guys. Here's my details. Unum Capital. Um, we, as I said, we, we do offer a local and offshore offering, multi-assets, multi-platforms. And I'm always available to chat for advice, questions, comments, and criticism.